Can you hear me now? Did you hear me before? Nothing's really changed, has it? <laughs> okay. Good concrete is not cheap. Cheap concrete is not good. And the other part is, you can't afford cheap concrete. It simply costs too much as a part of that. So if you're trying to buy the most economical concrete mix design you can, and you're not putting, you're not designing it for proper slumps, and you're adding water and you're doing things such as that, that's going to create problems that's going to cost a whole lot more than what it costs for typically kind good concrete mixtures. Now, the construction process, typically contractual documents specify materials, construction practices, tolerance, requirements, and those items. Two of the biggest words that you kind of run into in construction documents is budget and schedule. Now, like I said before is, two things is not going to change. You're not going to get more money unless you have a sufficient change order. And then the amount of money you get is not necessarily what you think it to be. When you're bidding a project, you have the ability to price it however you want. When you're getting a change order, you may not have that option. It may be debated. And the other one is schedule as a part of this. So it's important to realize that the process has to occur on time. And if problems occur, whether they're real or perceived, that the owner will not or cannot accept and repair without a change order, that's kind of typically when you have serious problems. And we've talked a good bit about cracking. A lot of concrete structures cracks. We've been in a lot of concrete structures. We've looked at them, and a lot of times the owner says, okay, I understand, concrete crack, fix this one, don't worry about this one, you have a very reasonable approach. But there's other times when the owner will not or cannot accept it, and the, and the amount of cracking is so great that nobody wants to fix that as a part of it. And that's when you really get into a lot of issues about who is actually responsible and who is going to, in essence, pick up the tap to fix cracks as a part of that. So, typically, what happens in many cases is people share the love. So you've got an owner that's requiring something to happen. So a lot of times there's a joint effort. The concrete contractor may fix this, may take out the concrete, put it in. You have different situations where the general contractor may take care of the issues, the concrete supplier supplies this at no cost. So a lot of times with debate, you know, you get a reasonable solution to the problem. A lot of times you have differences in repairing things and parts like that. Now, the other part is, is when you really find out who is responsible, and when you get into the debates, who's responsible and who is going to actually pay for this particular thing. And that's kind of where you get into there that somebody says, this is not my fault, it costs too much, I'm not going to pay for that. And then you typically work through and let's figure out how we're going to do this. So somebody says no. Now, Jeff made a statement. He showed that courtroom. You know, that great thing with all that oak wood sitting in there, and he says, when I'm in here, I make money. Well, the other part is, is when experts are in there, they make money as well. So, when you get into the, when you get into the, the legal part of it, that's when people start to spend a lot of dollars associated with that. I'm going to park that for a minute. I've seen a lot of issues with, with, with projects that the project is finished. There's a defect. And let's say the defect is cracking. And then, for some reason, you go through what I call a legal shakedown. The general contractor, the concrete contractor, somebody will say, I'm not going to pay you. I'm not going to give you your retainage. I'm not going to pay you the full amount of your material because uh, concrete is crap. Now, if we're talking about three or four million dollars, then that's going to be pursued, right? If we're talking about forty or fifty thousand bucks, twenty or thirty thousand bucks, what's going to typically happen? Now, Jeff just walked out. But I will promise you, you can't do much legal-wise for $50,000. So a lot of times, whether you are at fault or not, you get the opportunity to participate because it costs way more to fight it than it does to pay it. So in essence, again, is what I say. If, if, I'm, if I'm the general contractor and I come up to this gentleman and say, hey, listen, the concrete crack, okay? 
you know, I had to spend this much money. Why don't you kick in thirty or forty thousand dollars to the cows? And then I come up to the just boom, the concrete contract and said, Hey man, yeah, that concrete you placed didn't look too good. You see all these cracks in that thing? I had to get that thing fixed over there. Okay, and then I come up to this guy, the rebar guy. I said, you know, man, give me a break. You know, that well of wire fabric you put in, that is on the floor, that is on the ground. You should have chaired that up. I had to spend some big bucks to get all of this fixed. So I kind of worked these three guys here. They may or may not be responsible, so I get 20 out of him. This guy's better at it. I don't give a 15 out of him. This guy's easy. Got 30 out of him. So a lot of times when you get into situations like this, it's kind of what I call a legal shakedown. You hire an attorney, you spend some dollars on that, and then you work through that. Now, once it gets past that, and you start going through depositions, and you start hiring experts, you can spend a whole lot of money in a very, very fast period of time. In many cases, you can spend more money on legal fees than it costs to fix the crack in the first place as a part of it. So... You affect different things, the legal process, bonding capacity, all of those things. Now, in court, and I haven't been a bunch of times, but in court is one of the things I've figured out. The outcome is not going to be whether you're right or wrong. The outcome is going to be the skill of the attorneys as a part of that. And it is a, it is a coin shoot. You're getting 12 people on the jury or 6 people on the jury listening to things, talking about fracture mechanics and concrete and things such as that, which will put the normal person to sleep very quickly. So a, a lot of times it's the skill of the attorney that determines the outcome. And I think Jeff showed that in several of the slides and presentations he had. Okay, the real winners are the attorneys. One side loses less than the other. Now, this is what I really like. So you have a dispute. So... Let's just say the dispute is for a couple million dollars. So Lisa here, she's suing, and she just got a million dollars. So her attorney comes up to her and says, you know, hey, you were being sued for two million dollars. I got you a million dollars. I saved you a million dollars right there. And then we come over here to Adam. And, you know, Adam, you know, he sued her, and Adam didn't get but a million dollars, but his attorney says, hey, man, Adam, you didn't get nothing before. I got you a million dollars as a part of that. So I guess the point I want to make is, is typically in the legal process, it doesn't matter as much as who is fault, but who wins in the end. Now, I'm going to end with what I call the coolest cracking project that I've seen. This occurred about 30 years ago. It's real simple. It was a manufacturing facility. The drawing shows six-inch slab on grade, welded wire fabric, continuous through all construction, all control joints, no dowels at control joints. Six-inch slab. Now, how many people use welded wire fabric? How many people can place welded wire fabric in the top third of a concrete area and then place concrete on top of it? What is the tolerance for welded wire fabric? If you look in 117, there's not one. So, you know, in welding wire fabric, it's either on the bottom or hanging out the top. How many engineers do I have in here? How much is welded wire fabric control cracking if it's sitting on the bottom or hanging out the top? So I kind of think that number is kind of like close to zero as a part of that. Lisa, I didn't see you weigh in on that. <laughs> uh, so, no construction joint. Well, lo and behold, they referenced ACI 301, 302. Uh, and you guys are not going to believe this, but the four cracked. I mean, see, so, you know, you got, you know, you got all of this. It's cracked. This is a manufacturing facility. Uh, and so the floor has a bunch of cracks in it. So the owner sues for 70 million bucks. Now, let me refresh this. This was about 30 years ago. Now, not that 70 million bucks is not a lot of money, but 70 million bucks 30 years ago was a whole lot more money. So uh, the engineer kind of got brought into it. Now, this is a small firm. Somebody has the audacity to blame the design on this with the welded wire fabric and so forth. So uh, the engineer offers $170,000 for his errors in emission. He has $250,000 worth of it. He has spent eighty. He was politely told no. 
Remember, 70 million under 70,000. Big difference. So he collapsed his company. He died during litigation. It was not a result of this. He was just an old guy like me. Okay. So, uh, again, the concrete producer. So, you know, if you look at a ready-mix plant, now, if you own a small ready-mix plant, all of those cool-looking little trucks running around, they probably cost a couple hundred thousand bucks each, right? Batch plant costs two or three hundred thousand dollars each. So these guys have dollars. Okay, so they have dollars. So then they rolled over to them. Never understood the reason. So this thing, three years later, went to binding arbitration. It was ruled against the engineer. The concrete company was not liable. And really don't know what happened next. You know, I know the concrete guys got off, don't know what happened. The building was in use for that amount of time. So, responsibility, who gets it? Uh, if you're the owner and you have unrealistic expectations, if you're not willing to control cracks, then I think the, the blame should, in essence, go to the owner unless he is willing to spend the dollars with the design to optimize the amount of cracking that you tend to get. So if you've got, uh, as Rick said, if you're just doing this to get it done as quickly as you can, you're going to get cracks, you're going to get more than you need, so then it gets to be your problem. The architect engineer. I agree with Jeff, Rick, and about everybody else. You need to tell the owner, but make sure the owner understands the risk involved with concrete cracking. And owners, in my view, they vary upon their knowledge. If you talk to somebody who is an owner's rep and they build warehouses, they're well attuned to cracking, they're well attuned to curling, and they really understand those issues. So if, in essence, you're dealing with an architect engineer and he understands that this structure is going to be used and cracking or control joints or different things need to be done, he needs to make sure that this is designed and he needs to understand crack management. How you're going to handle these. The general contractor, not telling the owner that concrete cracks. You know, a lot of times, um, Jeff made that comment about the sparing document. If in essence you build a structure in accordance with the contract documents or maybe some level of variation, then it's typically not the fault of the contractor. But I've never seen that done. I have never seen that piece of it done before. I typically see variations in this. And to be honest with you, most of the time when I get into looking at contract documents, neither the contractor, the concrete subcontractor, the engineer, or the ready-mix producer know what's in the contract documents. Most people don't really have a clue, so most of the time that is an issue. But you got to have one that requires the meets the specifications. And if it's not, then that gets to be your responsibility. Also, you are responsible for the subcontractors. They work for the general contractor, so what their actions are in materials, they have, you have to manage them in such a fashion. The concrete contractor... You know, you see this lots of times. Uh, I'm doing a project called the Concrete Sales Guy. I need 4,000 PSI concrete. That's all I need. Four inch slump. That's all it is. Well, when you get to it, you can't place or you don't want to place that concrete at that particular slump. So you start adding water to it. So you add a little bit of water, you get an extra slump. So if you, you know, if you add water, and you continually change the concrete mix design as a part of a, a part of that, then that kind of gets to be your issue involved in this. So I think the best thing I can say about who is responsible, you know, it kind of starts with the owner. He's got to have reasonable expectations. He's got to be willing to pay for whatever type of level of structure he wants. Now, we heard Lisa talk about environmental structure designs and she did she, she works in the 350 world we heard frank malice earlier talking about general design he works in in essence the 318 world does anybody have a broad difference between a 318 and a 350 structure it's about three and a half and what that three and a half is is the amount of steel you have in those particular units 
350 units, 350 structures typically have a tremendous amount of steel. If you go to the new ACI 350 and you look at the recommended wall the spacings of walls for the amount of reinforcement, it is a tremendous amount. So 350 structures are designed to manage craft widths. 318 structures typically are not. So it's the, you know, it's the responsibility of the engineer to design it for the owner's needs, the contractor to build what's on the specifications, and the ready-mix producer to uh, to build the can to uh, place the concrete that was ordered and what was purchased by the purchase or by the purchase order.